All right. Hello, hello, hello. It has been a little while since I've done a Q&A, so I figured I'll answer all your burning questions. I've got all my questions in my little question book, and we're ready to go. I am still in New Mexico, by the way, so that's why the background is different than normal. I'm heading back to Seattle soon because it was just going to be a two-week altitude camp, but it's been amazing. Also, I've separated the questions into running, personal, recovery, random, and career. So I'm going to put chapters in this and you can skip between sections and just watch the parts that you're interested in. All right, so I'm going to start with the running questions. Number one, starting off with a bang. What is your record for number of pre-workout porta potty trips? Mine is six. Uh, the person said that theirs was six. So I respect they disclosed that to me. Mine is probably for a workout, like four but for a race, 11. Do you have any mantras you repeat during difficult runs? Yes, I definitely do. I like to repeat in my head over and over again, capable, capable, capable. It's just a single word, but it reminds me that I am capable of pushing through difficult workouts. I'm capable of continuing when I'm tired and I'm always capable of more than my brain thinks I am. What types of micro injuries have you had? And how did you rehab those? I kind of have persistent problems with my shins. So I was having some pain in my left shin where I have had a bone stress injury before. So I was just being really careful with that. And then also my left knee is asymmetrical from my right knee. So that was giving me a little bit of trouble. It's another problem that I deal with pretty frequently. And then my right hip got really tight. And I also have had two stress fractures in that area. So I just wanted to be overly cautious with all of those and to rehab I just kind of do all of the usual things I try to keep up with my mobility I do heel and toe walks and ankle band strengthening I also obviously do a lot of cross training and when any of those things flare up I just increase the cross training and decrease the mileage until that pain subsides in the long term having a few days off of running and maybe feeling like I'm missing acute fitness is actually really gonna pay off if I can't avoid those long-term injuries. Have you ever tried using a weighted vest while running? I have not, although I have seen studies that show that wearing a weighted vest, like just while you're living your everyday life can help to improve bone density. So I might try that at some point, but I don't really see a reason to run in a weighted vest because I think it would just increase injury risk and if you want to make running harder then just go uphill. Is cross training still the move for non-injury prone runners? I think personally cross training can be incorporated into any training schedule but ultimately if you're training for running I think that running will be the best stimulus because it's the most specific form of training so if you're not injury prone probably try to up the mileage before you up the cross training but if you find that there's a point where you can't push mileage further but you feel like you could train more that's when I would say add cross training. Tips for running faster. Well, I think my number one tip is find a training schedule that you can stay consistent with and try to polarize your training, really focus in on getting hard days with good intensity and the right sorts of intensities, um, not being in those gray zones between, you know, threshold and VO2 max and race pace, like really trying to key in on certain intensities and sticking with those, not just running for ego, and then keeping easy days easy and recovering as much as you need to on those days. Uh, also for other tips, like I have a bunch of videos and shorts that talk about workouts and training tips and cross training, so go watch those. If you could only do one race per year, what would it be? That's so hard because most races that I would like want as the one would be races that I had to qualify for. I would say if I could only do one race a year, it would probably be... the U.S. Road 5K Championships because it's not super short, it's not long, and it's really high competition. But it's also ironic that I said that because I've never done that race before. What resistance do you recommend on the elliptical? And this I think is a really important question. On most ellipticals, there are two settings. There's the ramp, which is basically like the incline, and then there's the resistance. Resistance makes it harder. Ramp just changes which muscles you activate. I would recommend putting the ramp low 
especially on pre-core ellipticals, like two or three, because that's more similar to a running movement. And then putting the resistance in nine, 10 or 11, somewhere in there, that obviously depends on how strong your legs are. For me, I feel like nine or 10 is pretty good for just easy elliptical and then 10 or 11 is pretty good for a workout but that varies between people why did you decide to make the move from track to trail for me personally well obviously it's me personally i got a little bit burnt out on the pressure of track just because it is very comparison driven and as I was trying to recover from an eating disorder, I felt like I was trying to get away from comparison and I kind of needed to be in a different environment to be able to actually enjoy racing. But with that said, I don't feel like I actually switched from track to trail. I just incorporated a trail into my racing regimen. So I'm not saying that I'm never gonna run track again. I love track, I love track workouts and there's nothing that would ever make me say I'm never racing track again. So I didn't really move from track to trail, I guess is what I'm saying. Can cross training be a permanent solution if you are injury prone? Yes, I think it can be. There are some, some people that have to be kind of low mileage for the rest of their lives. I think that that's completely fine. Like cross training is a great tool. You can get a lot of aerobic stimulus from cross training. So yes, I think that it can be a permanent solution if you do it in the right way. Favorite distance to run? I would actually say my favorite is 16 to 17 miles. Actually, no, my favorite would be 50K. I did a 50K ultra last summer and it was maybe the best run of my life. It was so fun. What are your favorite snacks? Now, I'm so glad you asked this because when I'm on a trip like this, packing snacks is absolutely essential. When I was packing for this altitude camp, snacks were obviously a priority, so that's why I'm thankful to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video. Magic Spoon has a variety of delicious, high-protein cereals with quality ingredients and have all that childlike nostalgia that you look for in a cereal, but with more protein and satiating qualities. And they also now have Magic Spoon treats in blueberry muffin and double chocolate flavor, which are absolutely delicious and are perfect for traveling or keeping in your bag for whenever you need a quick snack. For me, quality fueling is always important and I want to make sure I get enough protein to rebuild and refuel after my training sessions so it's great to have a treat like magic spoon that I can rely on for any time like when I'm stuck in a two-hour line at car rental this is saving me. besides being a portable snack magic spoon also adds a great crunch and protein boost to any meal or snack I have during the day and if you'd like to try magic spoon go to the link down below and you can build your own variety box with whatever flavors you want magic spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. So click the link below and use the code ALIO for $5 off your order. <sighs> okay, personal questions. Who do you love more, Georgie or Spencer? Obviously Spencer. Like Georgie, I love, but Spencer is my partner in life. I don't mean to bash dogs in general, but I can connect more deeply with a person than a dog. <laughs> and yeah, Spencer's my person. What's your favorite book and what's your favorite band? My favorite book is The Perks of Being a Wallflower. Every time I read it, it's just so eye-opening and mind-bending. It really makes me think and I think about it for months or years after I've finished reading it and I just think that's a, good, a sign of a good book. And then my favorite band right now is probably either Goth Babe or Boy With Uke. How did you and Spencer meet. Spence moved to Seattle to join the Brooks Beasts and I was on that team and at the time he came to Seattle we weren't meeting for official practice and I was one of the only people in town so we started kind of training together some. At the time I was cross training and Spencer would like come bike with me and he would go to the gym and elliptical with me which looking back now knowing how much he hates cross training like that is wild. He was really really into me but anyways at pretty much as soon as we started hanging out there was a vibe there it just was supernatural and we basically just immediately started hanging out every day <laughs> 
favorite non-running memory from college, I think this would probably have to be this one time I was in charge of taking care of my roommate when she went out and she ended up just doing the craziest stuff like trying to climb on top of the car while I was driving, climbing up trees so that we wouldn't have to go home. Like once we were home, climbing onto the roof of the house and like bringing her mattress into the backyard so she could sleep outside. It was hilarious and she wrote me the funniest note the next day and oh if you would tell your high school self one thing what would it be i would say trust in your ability don't worry about your appearance not that my eating disorder started because i wanted to appear small but i was so worried that my size changing would change my ability and i think at the end of the day that really inhibited me moving forward in my career can georgie update us on his career i'll ask him for an update later george um could you give us an update on your life and career goals um if i had to choose a sport other than running to go pro in what would it be it would be nordic skiing just because i think that's the one that i would have the best propensity for. I did do Nordic skiing in middle school and I was the borough champion in classic and skate. So yeah, sometimes I actually regret not going into skiing because it's much lower impact and I feel like I could have not gotten as injured. So yeah, I don't know. Where do you see yourself in five years? I really hope that I'm still doing what I'm doing. I really hope that I'm still running and having success. I'm only 27 right now, so in five years, I'm 32. And honestly, like that could still be at my athletic peak. So I hope that I'm able to continue building and be consistent with my training and my fueling and just be able to start really getting into a good groove with training and racing. Recovery questions now. <laughs> How do you fight feelings of needing to earn your food? Obviously, this is a really difficult thing to get past being an athlete and having a very high training volume. One thing that helped me was taking rest days and practicing eating the same or, you know, actually what I was hungry for on those rest days. It was really, really hard at first and it still is hard, but it's actually slowly getting easier and I find that I'm much better able to listen to my body when I allow myself to eat regardless of my training. For instance, the other day I was tired and I didn't want to double and before I would think, oh, but if I want to be able to like eat a snack, then I need to double. But this time I was like, well, I don't want to double. I'm tired and I can still eat whatever I'm hungry for, regardless of whether I double. It is super helpful to be able to allow yourself that because it not only helps you fuel, but helps you actually key in to what training is best for you. How do you manage self-doubt? I definitely struggle with this because I used to pull so much confidence from the way that my body looked and now I'm trying not to put any stock into the way that I look and instead put stock into how I feel. But it is hard because then when I feel bad in workouts, I'm like, well, where do I get this confidence from? What can make me feel better about myself? And what it really comes down to is building a self-worth outside of athletics and outside of appearance and knowing that I am a worthy person regardless of what my results say or what my body looks like. That's a very slow and long process, but I think that journaling, um, building hobbies outside of your sport, connecting with family and friends, and taking time to reflect can all help build that. How did your family react to your ED and did they know before you opened up? They definitely knew they had shown signs of concern, but I think there was just nothing they could really do because I didn't want to change. And when I did decide to be open about it and go to eating disorder recovery treatment, they were like super, super happy about it, very supportive. My mom actually stayed with me for the six weeks that I was in treatment. So yeah, they're, they're super supportive. <laughs> Do you really hate chocolate or is it a fear food? Yes, I really hate it, trust me. It's been that way since I was like two years old. Where do you think your ED stems from? And do you remember being a kid with body image issues? The ironic thing is, is that I don't remember having any issues with body image until my ED started. And then I remember being very self-conscious of my body because I looked so much younger than my peers. But before that, I never had any issues with it. 
yeah and then now i think i have issues because i just compare myself so much to my ed self but yeah my ed just stemmed from fear of going through puberty and getting slower at running like <laughs> It's really that simple. <laughs> How would you talk to a child about staying in shape without doing any fat shaming? And what should you say to athletes who are worried about going through puberty and getting bigger? I would say for a kid staying in shape, I think the important thing other than like telling them to stay in shape, it's instilling healthy habits. So giving them knowledge about nutrition making foods out to be good or bad but just giving them knowledge about how it might make them feel and giving them prompts to think about that and notice how they feel and then as far as activity goes helping them to build an activity playground where they actually truly enjoy what they're doing so that they'll be lifelong exercisers instead of feeling like it's a chore and then for athletes going through puberty i think it's really important to emphasize that puberty is not something you can skip without consequences, that if you want to be your best, strongest athlete and have longevity in the sport, it is absolutely essential to go through. And not only that, but it will actually enable you to be faster and better later on, even if it doesn't in this exact moment. What's the best part about recovery? I think just like having more flexibility around food and especially on vacations or trips. Right now, there are four people in the house and we're alternating who makes dinner each night. And I'm okay with that. I don't need to worry about what's going to be served because I'll eat whatever it is. And that never would have happened before. Have you struggled with losing your menstrual cycle? I got so many questions about this and related topics. So I'm actually going to make a whole other video on this. So if you have questions about periods, training, eating disorders, amenorrhea, leave them below. How did you overcome your ED and go on to pursue running? Well, I think it's an ongoing process and I've talked about this so much throughout my videos on YouTube, but the main thing is I just made the decision that I was no longer going to give my eating disorder space. I was no longer going to allow it to dominate my life. Then I made the effort to make that happen. I was committed to that in the same way that I'm committed to my training. And I don't think it's fully gone, but as long as I keep that commitment, I fully believe that someday it will be. Tips for accepting your body. I think beginning tips for me are body neutrality. And that includes just trying not to look at my body, try to not give it importance by inspecting it. Just trying to be like, oh yeah, it's a body. That's cool. And then eventually maybe you can get to positivity where you look at it and you compliment it instead of seeing it and picking it apart. But for me right now, I'm still kind of in the just trying not to look at myself too much phase, which obviously is hard when I'm editing videos. But like, I don't really look in the mirror very often. I used to body check all the time and I don't do that. And I think trying to pay less attention tricks your brain into thinking that it matters less to you. Hardest part of ED treatment then versus now. When I was in treatment, the hardest part was feeling like all of the control over my life was taken away from me. Cause not only was I not making decisions about my food, but I was no longer making decisions about how I spent my time because my day was very, very regimented and super busy. So I just felt overwhelmed because every element of control in my life had been stripped from me. Now, I think the hardest part is the accountability and staying true to myself and being able to parse through my thoughts and my motivations and making sure that they're pure and not getting infiltrated by the ED. And now we are on to career questions. What would you be doing professionally if you weren't a runner and YouTuber? At one point in my life, I thought that I wanted to be a coach. At one point, I thought I wanted to be a dietitian. And I think now if I were going to go into something, I would want to go into marketing because I, I think it sounds fun. I have no experience. I don't have a degree in business. I just think uh, it would be fun to go into marketing. So yeah, I think that's what I'd do. Do you miss coaching at SPU? And this was asked by one of the SPU athletes. I really, really miss the team because I definitely felt like I bonded with them and enjoyed seeing them every day. But... I don't miss the amount of time that it demanded of me and how tired it made me. And I don't miss driving the van. <laughs> 
So yeah, I wish that I could fit it all in, but I just don't feel like it's conducive to my life right now. What made you want to start YouTube? I started because I saw Spencer doing it and I was like, you know, I think I could do that too. And he's spending all this time editing and like, what am I supposed to do during that time? So I was like, well, I'll just start a YouTube channel. And then when he's editing, I'll edit and it'll be cool. And it was cool. It worked out well. Do you do anything besides sponsorships and YouTube for money? I have a couple of side hustles. I do a little bit of writing for this website called FanHub, but those are very, very small side gigs and most of my income comes from running and social media. How do runners get paid? Winning, contracts, appearance fees, sponsors. It's definitely really complicated and kind of a wild world out there with pro running, but I would say most runners make the majority of their income from a contract with a main shoe and apparel sponsor and then they'll make additional money from appearance fees and winning races the winning races will cause two forms of income there will be bonuses from the shoe contract and also prize money obviously depending on how well an athlete does they could end up making more money from prize money and bonuses than their base contract but that's not the case for most. What do you find difficult about being on YouTube? The nature of social media demands consistency and the hard part for me is that I do make all of my own content. So it's really hard to keep up with it sometimes, especially when training is heavy or I have races going on or I'm on vacation with my family. Like I'm kind of never off of work. I don't get PTO and that's not me complaining, but it is hard to not get burnt out. I enjoy it most of the time. It's just every once in a while, I really wish I could take a break. On to a random questions. How many kindergartners could you fight if they were released one by one? Now, I know that this question might seem ridiculous, but I really wanna give it the respect it deserves and think about this critically. I don't really know how big kindergartners are because it's been a long time since I was in kindergarten, but I remember at the time we measured to see who was the closest in size to an emperor penguin? And the class was pretty mixed, you know? So I think an emperor penguin is about the size of a kindergartner, but a kindergartner is not very coordinated. I honestly think I could take them down pretty quickly. So I'm gonna say the first one maybe takes 30 seconds to take down. It's gonna get longer as I get more tired. So I'll say, we'll average it out to two minutes per kid. And I think at an hour of continual fighting, I'm gonna be pretty tapped out, but I'd be able to muster out maybe two or three more kids, but then I'm just gonna be exhausted. So I'm gonna say 33 kindergartners. Who would win in a fight, 10,000 ants or Georgie? I don't think this one is close. I hate to do this to the guy, but Georgie's definitely losing in that. 10,000 ants, like, they're, they're gonna swarm him. He won't be able to see, he won't be able to breathe, he won't be able to do his spins before he eats his food. He's got no shot. Unfortunately for the boy, I just think those ants are taking him right down, right down. But yeah, that is all the questions. And I hope that everyone enjoyed this and it was very informative. If you have more questions, leave them below. I usually answer all comments that are made within the first 24 hours. I look forward to reading through those and thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe, like, and play this video one more time through, you know? Why not, right? Anyways, that's all for now, folks.